This is 1988 Tops, where every card has a story to tell. Your hosts are David McKellis and Matt Kuzma. Let's play ball. Welcome back to 1988 Tops. David, what's our card for this week? Two cards this week. Sean Dunstan, card number 695, and the Cubs 1987 Team Leaders card, card number 171. Sean Dunstan, shortstop for the Chicago Cubs. Sean Dunstan, looking forward to this one. But first, we have some breaking news, David, that was sent to us by listeners on Twitter and on Facebook about the baseball cards in the wall story. Thank you to at MDAlbert88, Steve Jeltz enthusiast, and Eric R. on Facebook for sending us this story about a house in Boise, Idaho. I don't want people to get any ideas, but this house in Boise, Idaho, one of the walls is entirely covered in baseball cards. In the video, they do show a Jack Lazorko. They show multiple Willie Hernandez cards. And he covered this entire wall, just glued old cards to the wall. And there's a lot of 88 tops on there. When what must be called a crime against the fine principles of home interior design, the next owners of the home covered the wall of baseball cards with outdoor shingles and then painted them green and that's how they obscured the cards that were underneath. It's, it was really hideous. And then what I do love, my favorite part of the video is that uh, the homeowner who's you know ripping off the shingles and hoping to get to the bare bones of the house as they're doing a gut rehab, they realize that- I'm hoping there was not mold and- Can you believe that? I was delightfully surprised there was not mold. And- uh... I was surprised, shocked, confused. I wasn't sure what I was looking at until we continued to pull down the shingles. And found this wall of fame. Well, it is a wall, just not necessarily of fame. I mean, no offense, Dave Revering, Jack Lazorko, and Dan Schnatzetter, but if you need a Tom Needen viewer. No offense, Jack Lazorko. And I say, sir, do you know who you're talking about? One of the most interesting men in all of 1988 tops, Jack Lazorko, who would kick save a comebacker up the middle as fast as you could spit. As you know, my other podcast, Matt's This Old House of Cards, this is really a technique that's very popular. Any rumpus room, I feel like, should be covered in cards, any pool hall. And I also have a a very advanced uh, architectural design for a... A boudoir featuring Kirk McCaskill. So thank you to the listeners for sending us that story. The mailbag is always open on Twitter, but also uh, you can email us at 1988topspodcast at gmail.com. And then finally, we do have some follow-up from last week's episode on Pat Perry. Thank you to Font of Baseball Wisdom and former guest Mark Simon for pointing out that it was Dwayne Statz who was the announcer on the Pat Perry home run. His first at bat at Wrigley Field, Pat Perry hits a home run, and we were trying to figure out it wasn't Steve Stone or Harry Carey, it was current voice of the Rays, Dwayne Statz. I was confused because Harry Carey did the post-game show of that game, but he wasn't announcing when the home run was hit. We think that it was due to his 1987 stroke. It's possible that Carey's activities were still limited in 1988 when Pat hit the home run, The timing of this game makes sense. Stats and Carey and Stone were all on hand for the first night game at Wrigley, which was just three days after Pat Perry's home run. Thanks to Sean Dunstan being the subject of this week's episode, we're going to have a lot more opportunities to mess up Cubs stuff today. (laughs) It's our favorite thing to do, David. So let's go to Sean Dunstan. This was suggested by a listener. This was a recommendation from at El Salgado Media on Twitter. He said, I can't believe I didn't ask this before, but can Sean Dunstan get the treatment? And he asked this back in August, and then I had a baby and forgot. So sorry about that. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry about that, Brian. We do get to these suggestions. It sometimes just takes a little while. And the reason why the name came up also is that Sean's daughter, Jasmine, was in the news just this past week, and we will get to that big news a little bit later on. 
But we also get to talk about two cards this week, so we're always looking to knock out multiple cards. Dunstan was a highly touted young player who would become a fan favorite in Chicago, even if he maybe didn't quite live up to the lofty expectations that a number one overall draft selection might have. And we have a Sabre bio this week from Thomas Brown Jr. So thank you, Thomas. We will be using your research uh, very well today. And so let's go to the front of 695. It feels like a very classic Little League pose for picture day. Like get down on one knee, hold the bat, look at the camera and smile, except Sean forgot to smile. That's a scowl. It's a good mustache, though. Dunstan had a good mustache in 87 here, and on both of these cards displaying a high-quality mustache. He looks very lean in this picture, very high hat. This is definitely a, a spring training shot, or maybe it was taken at the field where Tom Amansky shot his Fred McGriff training videos. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen a card with a crouch like this, have we? No, no, this is the only one. Yeah, because he's on one knee, and then kind of leaning over, it's it doesn't look very comfortable for him. This is a good use of the space on the card. Fills up the frame very nicely. Just would have been nice for him to smile. Now getting to the back of 695. And we have Sean Dunstan, shortstop, height 6'1", weight 175, right-handed batter and thrower. Drafted by the Cubs in the first round, 1982. Born March 21st, 1963 in Brooklyn, New York, with a home of Corona, New York. And David, first thing we should start with is, am I pronouncing his first name right? We corrected this on a previous episode. I grew up calling him Shawan because that's how it's spelled. But in everything I've seen, it's Sean. And so I think we're going with Sean. Unless somebody can send me some verifiable evidence otherwise. I even watched recent interviews with him where he was called Sean we're going with Sean. Yeah, Harry Carey pronunciations from the 1980s do not count. Dunstan was born in Brooklyn, grew up in Brooklyn. We didn't get to talk about Brooklyn on the Lou Whitaker episode because Lou moved away as a baby. But Sean was born there and grew up there. Brooklyn, New York City, where they paint murals of Biggie. If each borough was a city, Brooklyn would be the third largest city in the United States. And we Probably can't even begin to talk about all the famous Brooklynites, but the borough of Brooklyn is named for the town of Breuklin in the Netherlands. Hans von Breuklin, contrary to his name, wasn't from Breuklin. He was born in Utrecht and played for the Dutch national team in the 1980s, winning the 1988 Euros as the goalkeeper for the Dutch national team. He also played for FC Utrecht and the Nottingham Forest team under Brian Clough in the 1980s. The city of New Breuklin was taken by the English in 1664 after the Second Anglo-Dutch War and renamed to a more Anglophone Brooklyn. And then at some point in the 2010s, it was taken over by Lena Dunham and, and her girlfriend. <laughs> and, it's never, and it's never been the same since. I, as a Chicagoan, do not have the inferiority complex that many Chicagoans have against New York. Love New York, love Brooklyn. New York fans, don't at me. I love your city. Sean grew up in the Linden Apartments, public housing development. His father, Jack, was a taxi driver and furniture delivery man, described their living conditions as a slum. The family was poor, but Sean didn't really think about it when he was a kid. His parents were able to provide for him to the extent that, that he expected, and he didn't think of himself as poor. His mom, Brenda, worked in a clothing store. He went to Thomas Jefferson High School, and while we didn't earlier get into all of the famous people from Brooklyn, here comes a, one of my favorite lists of alumni that we have ever gone through here. So we have Ezra Jack Keats, who wrote one of my daughter's favorite books, The Snowy Day, and another author from Jefferson High School wrote a book that has aspirationally sat on my shelf for years, and that's Howard Zinn, who wrote A People's History of the United States. Uh, Riddick Bow. The late Sharon Jones of Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings, Lil Fame of MOP, the Mash Out Posse, and uh, also Mama's Boy Otis, who's one of a kind and the ladies love him for his body and his mind. Otis Wilson, <laughs> famous singer, soloist of the Bear Shuffling Crew. <laughs> Another famous singer, Linda November. Linda is famous for singing the, the meows in the meow mix. Mm. The meow, 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 that one. That's a that's a wonderful Linda November impression, Matt. It's down an octave, but I, I'm, I'm familiar with the melody. 
yeah, it's, that was good. She also sang in some other famous jingles, but I don't know if any are as, quite as good as the Meow Meow Meows. <laughs> <laughs> the Meow Meow Meows, one of my favorite bands from Brooklyn. While Sean was at Jefferson High, his parents and teachers made sure that he stayed on task. And Sean said that without that discipline from his parents, he's not sure what might have happened to him. He got into some mischief, but nothing too serious. He said turnstile jumping and throwing rocks at cars, which with Sean's arm, that could be dangerous. But he mostly focused on baseball. If he was doing bad in a class, the teachers would talk to his baseball coach and he would get held out of a game and that kept him on track academically. On the baseball field at Jefferson, and field is a generous term here, it was described by the New York Times as a desolate landfill close to a garbage dump, he was a star. He hit a home run in his first at bat as a freshman, and then he had outrageous stats as a senior, hitting 790 with 10 home runs. Yeah, 790. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's the highest batting average we've spoken about anybody in any context so far. Right. Like, I think even in a single series of the playoffs, you know, even the Will Clark against the Cubs in 1989, I don't think that was a 790 batting average. 790 as a senior. And he stole 37 bases in 26 games without being caught. (laughs) So with those numbers, he was very highly regarded. He, He hit 790. That said, with the way that Sean's eye was at the plate, his on base percentage was also probably 790. But he was compared to Carl Yastrzemski and Mike Schmidt coming out of high school. And on one list in 2011, he had the third best arm in infield history. According to scout Howie Hawk, who was the famous pirate scout who signed Roberto Clemente and Tony Pena, he said that the organization only ever had two players scouted with the highest arm grade, basically saying they had perfect arms. And that was Roberto Clemente and Sean Dunstan. So with those kind of stats and that kind of defensive capability, the Cubs picked him with the number one pick in the 1982 draft. He was the first number one pick from New York City. He had no agent, so he went with his parents to negotiate, and he said that he was willing to go to college if the money wasn't there. And according to baseball reference, he signed for a $135,000 bonus and then was sent straight to Sarasota. Well, pretty savvy without an agent to... Get a bonus that big in 1982 dollars, it sounds pretty good. So he starts his minor league career in Sarasota, and he makes a quick ascent through the minors. He hits over 300 in rookie ball, and then single A and double A in 1982, 83, and 84. As you mentioned before, great speed, stealing 58 bases in 1983, and not a lot of power, although that wasn't really expected of shortstops at the time. He was hitting great. His fielding was getting better and he had a great arm. And the organization really just sees him as the top prospect. He's going to be their shortstop of the future. But it was clear even to Sean at the time, he said, I have to mature. There's no rush. I have the capabilities, but I'm not ready yet. He didn't strike out a lot, but he never walked. Seven walks and 455 at bats at A level. And we'll see that throughout his career while he's hitting in the 270 range his on-base percentage is under 300. He also made a lot of errors, 47 at A-ball, and then in 84, he split time between AA and AAA, had a combined 58 errors. After his promotion to AAA, the level of pitching finally caught up with him at the plate. His average fell to 233 in 61 games at Iowa. But even with that slowdown, he comes into 1985, and the Cubs are willing to give him a shot to compete in spring training to try to make the squad and his competition is 39 year old Larry Boa in what would be his final season and Dunson ends up winning the spot for opening day. Cubs are coming off their 1984 playoff appearance. They started fast and they were in first place well into June. And that leads to the fun facts on the card. It says that he collected his first Major League hit April 9th, 1985. He belted his first Major League home run May 4th, 1985. Unfortunately for Sean, he only hit 194 through May 11th and ended up sent back down to AAA. He did have a fun highlight in May, and we always love to have a fun announcer, so we we can go to Harry Carey on the mic for this call. Kid. 
But Sean Dunstan is on second base, attempts to steal third. The catcher makes an error trying to put throw him out at third, and he ends up coming home to win the game. And it really impresses Harry Carey. Yes, and you know you can see the kind of player that Dunstan was, hustling, stealing bases, sliding in, just a an exciting player. So aside from a couple of, of high points, Sean was hitting only 194 and, and was sent back down to AAA shortly after that game-winning steal. At AAA, he improved on his 1984 performance at the plate and in the field, hitting 268. He cut his errors in half, and he earned another call-up in the fall, having regained his confidence, and he finished out the season pretty strong. He hit 321 over the last month to bring his season average up to 260. That 85 Cubs team finished under 500, disappointing considering the season that they had prior. They had a lot of injuries. There's a video that is the story of the 1985 Cubs, and it's just called Ouch. <laughs> I feel like there are, there are a number of years in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, and 2010s you could put in that same category, David. But going into 1986, we can get to the rest of the fun fact, which is that Dunson hit his first five-hit Major League game on April 19th, 1986. An example of what was a pretty good year for Dunstan. He hit 250 with 17 home runs, 37 doubles, and 68 batted in. I don't know that we've seen anywhere else in the series it pointed out that someone had their first five-hit game. But that's pretty impressive. He ends up playing 150 games that season, so he is the dedicated starter at short. And at this point, on the defensive side of the ball, he led the majors in errors with 32. But on the positive side, he also led all National League shortstops in putouts and assists. He's making some highlight reel catches and added a little bit of pop to his game. He had 17 home runs, and and he's slowly becoming a fan favorite. Going into 1987, he knows that he has one thing left to do to really add to his value at the plate. And... That was to maybe get on base a little bit more through walks. He was asked about changing his game, maturity level, and he said, I want to get to at least 40 or 50 walks this year. If that's maturing, fine, I'll do it. Uh, He didn't quite get there yet, 10. (laughs) (laughs) Not, Not that many. Only 95 games, though. He had a broken finger, so... You know, expanded out to a whole season's worth of games, and maybe it's more like 18. That's, yikes. But his performance in 1987 did give us a second card today. He is on the team leader's card, which is card 171. He's alongside Manny Trio. I don't quite understand why these two guys were selected. That season, the Cubs finished in last place, but they had the MVP in Andre Dawson. They had Rick Sutcliffe. They had multiple Hall of Famers on this team, Sandberg, Lee Smith. And if we look at the back of the card, neither of these guys is on there. Dawson had a monster season. Sandberg was pretty good. On the pitching side, Rick Sutcliffe was possibly should have been, you know, sorry, Steve Bedrosian, but Rick Sutcliffe maybe should have been the Cy Young winner. And instead, you have Dunstan, who is kind of disappointing that season and injured, and Manny Trio, who was a 36-year-old utility infielder. He had a good season, but it's still an odd choice. One commonality here, Dunstan was known for having that great arm. When Trio was a Philly, he was an all-star gold glove winner and had one of the strongest arms at second base in baseball. But he wasn't even the starting second baseman for the Cubs. That was Sandberg. Maybe this is one of those like the Cardinals team leader card with the past and future, or maybe they just didn't have any good team picks of the other guys. Yeah, it's a good looking picture, if nothing else. So... Maybe they're just leaders in being photogenic. That's good enough for the Topps company. So in 1988, Dunstan makes his first All-Star game, hitting 287, eight homers and 13 steals at the break, and joins his double play partner, Ryan Sandberg, on the National League team. Dunstan said that Sandberg helped him settle down in the field and, and that Sandberg made him look good by being his double play partner. Meanwhile, Mark Grace said of Dunstan, I owe him a lot. Nobody would know how good I was at digging balls out of the dirt if it wasn't for him and all those bad throws. <laughs> Grace won four gold gloves. He probably owes at least one of them to Dunstan. <laughs> what a great teamwork going on there. And unfortunately, Sean didn't get onto the field 
at that all-star game. And the second half of the season, he slows down. He hits only 202 in the second half, only one more home run. So he's a little bit of trouble at the plate. He did finish the season with 30 steals, though. That was a a high to that point. 1989, as we discussed in the Mark Grace episode, this was a huge year for the Cubs. Of course, their all-star shortstop was a big part of that, except he started terribly. Through June 3rd, he's hitting 187. And Rick Sutcliffe joked that the team would present him with a signed baseball when he hit the 200 mark. Luckily for Sean at that time, the Cubs were still in first place regardless of his terrible average at the plate. They would face some competition, but by early August, they took first place and didn't really look back. And then Dunstan went on a really good run from June through the end of the season, hitting 313 over that stretch. And he probably had that good run thanks in part to the support of the Cubs faithful and the Shanometer. Yeah, the Shanometer is something I really remember. Something that sticks out about Cubs games and watching them on WGN as a kid. It just was the strangest thing to see a live updated board of Sean Dunstan's batting average after each at bat. And it was made by a fan by hand, updated with a calculator in game to display Sean's rising batting average. It made its first appearance on June 5th, shortly after he hit the 200 mark when Sean was hitting 203, and it was constantly pointed out by Harry Carey and and added to the fun of those Cubs games at Wrigley and that run to the playoffs and the legend of Sean Dunstan. I'll make an admission here. I thought it existed because Sean Dunstan was good (laughs) and because he was going to make a run at a batting title or something. No, it, it existed to encourage him because he wasn't very good you can get a <laughs> but you can get a shano meter shirt from obvious shirts that shows the final batting average that sean had for that season he ended up at 278 but the shano meter shirt says 278 and rising he also ended up with 20 doubles six triples 19 stolen bases on the season and the cubs make the playoffs as we discussed on the Mark Grace episode, they lost to the Giants in five games, but Sean hit 316 in that series with hits in the last four games. So successful for him in that regard. 1990, the Cubs fall back to earth. They were 10 games out of first place by early June, but Dunson had a pretty good first half. Yeah, much like the Richard Dotson episode, we have a guy who can get a good half of a season, <laughs> and he had two half, <laughs> two halves of a season in a row here the last half of 89 and the first half of 90, where if you combine those, you have one solid all-star season. But Sean hits 282 with 13 home runs, makes his second all-star game. This time he got the play, but he went 0 for 2. But then he ended the season only with 17 home runs. So only four in the second half. He, He didn't quite put it together with two excellent halves. 1991, he has another decent season hitting 260. And after the season, the Cubs signed him to a four-year, $12 million contract. People told Sean, you could make more somewhere else. I don't want to make more. I want to stay here. Sean Dunstan was pretty loyal to the Cubs. Unfortunately for the Cubs, they spent a lot of that money on a guy who wasn't playing. Dunstan had a herniated disc in 1992 that required surgery, kept him out for all but 25 games in 92 and 93 combined. In the 93 expansion draft, he was left unprotected. And he was actually pretty disappointed in this, and he felt he had been loyal to the Cubs and that maybe they didn't return that that same loyalty. He said he didn't want to play for them again, but after he wasn't picked in the draft, he came back around and, and ended up playing in 88 games in 1994, though injured. And he played pretty well, hitting 278 with 11 home runs. It took a full workout regimen just to stay on the field. And he said during the game, I'm mostly dead, but my mind has taken over my body. Oh, man. That is that is tough to hear. Well, in 1995, he has one of his best offensive seasons, hitting 296. I mean, that's a pretty miraculous comeback. 30 doubles and 14 home runs. But after the season, there was a rumor that the Cubs would move Dunstan to third base. But they didn't really talk to him about it. It was just a rumor. When reached, he said that... He would do it if asked, but the Cubs never really told him flat out. Instead, they just granted him free agency and didn't re-sign him. And so he ends up signing with the Giants, playing 82 games. 
and then was a free agent at the end of the season in 1996 and comes back to the Cubs. He ended up playing well enough in that return to Wrigley to get some trade interest. And he was traded to the Pirates who were contending at the time. The players on the Cubs were not really aware of the trade. Dunstan called his friend Mark Grace the morning of the trade and told him. And Grace was disappointed. He said Sandberg was going to retire at the end of the season. And it really hit Grace that he was it. The only one left in that longtime infield. And he said, Sean is irreplaceable. His charm, his sense of humor, his smile. He's one of the sweetest guys you'll ever meet. A heart of gold. I'll miss him. Which... Coming from Mark Grace, is a, that's a high compliment. Dunson then bounces around, playing for four more teams in 98, 99, and 2000. He plays for Cleveland, for the Giants again, for the Cardinals, and for the Mets. So this career just keeps stretching on a lot further than we thought after given how much pain he had been through. By this point, he's more of a utility guy, playing shortstop a little bit, second base, and outfield, as well as a lot of pinch hitting and pinch running. He got a couple more chances to play in the playoffs for the Mets in 1999 and then the Cardinals in 2000. And finally, prior to the 2001 season, he signs for the Giants again. He's 38, but he ends up playing in 160 games over two seasons in San Francisco and got a chance to appear in the World Series for the first time in 2002. In the series, the Giants are up three games to two, and Dunson hits a home run to put the Giants up 2 nothing in Game 6. And his nine-year-old son, Sean Jr., was an honorary bat boy and met him at home plate after the home run, which was a really nice moment. Sean said it was the best moment of his baseball career. Unfortunately, it would be followed up by one of the worst moments of Sean's career. The Giants were up 5-0 and ultimately blow that lead. Sorry, San Francisco fans, for bringing this up. And they lost 6-5. The loss was terrible. Dunstan had to console his son, who's there with him at the game. And and then Sean didn't play in Game 7. The Giants would lose, and Dunstan retired. The home run in Game 6 was the last hit of his Major League career, and unfortunately his career ended on, on that sad, sad note of losing the World Series after being on the precipice. So closing the book on Sean Dunstan's career, 269 average, over 1,500 hits, 150 home runs, 212 steals and two all-star appearances, as well as an appearance in the World Series. And in 2008, he received one Hall of Fame vote, but was off the ballot for future consideration after that. How about in retirement? He went into coaching for the Giants, and he's still there. He spent some time as an on-field coach, as well as a replay analyst. And as a coach, he has three World Series rings. On a return to Anaheim, the site of that disappointing loss in 2002, in 2018, he said, I would trade my three rings as a coach for one as a player. I wanted one as a player. And of course, Sean maybe would have preferred that to be in a Cubs uniform. He loved his time in Chicago and loved Cubs fans. And it's interesting, I never really got the impression as a kid from Cubs fans that they viewed Dunstan as a disappointment. I think a lot of my friends really liked Sean Dunstan as a player. When I look and see that he was the number one overall pick, you know, he wasn't quite Ken Griffey Jr., but he was the Cubs' starting shortstop for nearly a decade, played in the playoffs, made two all-star games, and then just kept playing forever. He never quite progressed into what the Cubs expected him to be. He wasn't quite Carl Yastrzemski or Mike Schmidt as he was compared to when he was drafted. He never really developed an eye, and his his power and defense were were inconsistent. In fact, he had the 10th fewest walks in history of any player with 5,000 plate appearances. But he's kind of a legend, both for the Shawnometer and for the excitement and and intensity that he brought on the field. The fan who invented the Shawnometer said he chose Dunstan because he, quote, typifies the Cubs. The little team that could, the lovable losers, Dunstan wraps it up in one ball player— You have to be behind him because you know he could be great. Dunstan appreciated the sign, and he said, I loved those Cubs fans. Whether you you were the best player on the Cubs or not, they treated you like you were the best. And when he left the Cubs, the fan who created the sign presented it to him. And there's a picture of him giving Sean a hug and handing him the sign. And it's really a lovely picture. Aside from his play on the field and his legacy with the Cubs and maybe the sentimental fandom of, of 80s Cubs fans, 
There's another, I think, important element to Dunstan's story that that I raised a little bit earlier with his daughter, Jasmine. And this is something that we've seen with a few other players in the series, players coming out of poverty and the creation of generational wealth and what baseball can do for a person and for their family. When he was playing, Sean said that he visited New York and he was back home and he was sad because he was going through a difficult time in the majors. He was in a little bit of a slump. And his dad said, what is wrong with you? You're making $550,000 a year. You have a wife and a baby girl, a nice house, a Mercedes. And then he took him back to the old neighborhood. And they drove around the streets where Sean grew up. And Sean said, I saw what might have been. I recognize people that I grew up with and we played on the same corners. People who had talent in different areas, but they went nowhere. I felt sorry and I realized that I was lucky and that there wasn't any pressure on me or shouldn't be. I broke out of the slump the next week. Sean played professional baseball for 18 seasons, making nearly $25 million playing baseball. That changes the trajectory of his family history. This is a kid who, he could have gone to college. He might have gotten a scholarship. But who knows what might have happened. He might have dropped out. He might not have made the team. He might have run into trouble with a coach or something like that. Instead, he went pro, took that step, and made it. And he made an amazing life for his parents his wife of 34 years, Tracy, and his four children. Sean Jr., who was devastated as a nine-year-old when he watched his dad's team lose in the 2002 World Series, went on to play in the Cubs minor league system. Sean Jr.'s career is mentioned in the Sabre bio, but part of the reason why we chose Sean this week is that his daughter, Jasmine, was in the news this week. Jasmine's career isn't mentioned in that bio yet. Just this past week, Jasmine Dunstan was named the White Sox Director of Minor League Operations, and she takes over that position from Grace Guerrero's wit, who had been with the White Sox organization for 40 years. She was an early female front office executive and a trailblazer for other women, and particularly women of color in baseball. Jasmine herself was a college softball player, has a master's in sports management and a law degree. She was with the Reds Player Development Department last year, and when she told Sean about Getting the job with the White Sox, she said he cried like a baby. He is so proud of his daughter, but his hard work and the time that he spent talking baseball and taking his kids to games and that Tracy spent taking kids to games set Jasmine up for this position. And so Sean, a child of Brooklyn's projects, son of a cab driver, was able to help his kids both educationally and with job opportunities to succeed that maybe somebody in Sean's position wouldn't have had. And so I think particularly... This is Black History Month. We have a, a strong black father, and we have now a, a young black woman who's in a position of authority in the White Sox organization. And I think that's really great and something that, as a White Sox fan, I'm very proud of the organization for doing. Jasmine's story is one we'll continue to follow, but a great story about Sean and the entire family. So thank you, David. Thank you for that. Thank you again, Thomas Brown Jr. for the Sabre bio and El Salgado Media for the request. And thank you to you at home for listening. If you've got a rumpus room you've just redecorated, we'd love to see it on Twitter. You can send your photos to us at Tops1988. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>